Mr. Dyers, mm. as you know, we've recently initiated an eminent scholar's archive and the first person we spoke to was Professor Lipstein. This opened up some very interesting reminiscences and if I may say so, there are some similarities with your situation. You both arrived in Cambridge before the Second World War and in addition to seeing the department go through the trauma of war, you both had to adapt to a new way of life in a strange country. You've been associated with the Faculty of Law and the Library for almost 70 years, but <laughs> I'd like to start before that with your early life in Ceylon. So could you give me some recollections of your early days, for example, where you grew up, your family, your home, your education, and were you exposed to law at an early age? Yes, well, uh, uh, well, I was born in 1921, and uh, until the age of 18, I lived in Ceylon, uh, <coughs> in Colombo. My family was very legal. Uh, my grandfather was a judge of the Supreme Court, and my father was a judge of the Supreme Court, so it was inevitable that I should follow suit. Um, I, wondered, hmm? I wondered about that, whether your family had been legal. Oh, yes, they had yes. been, yes. And um, during that period, I know one thing my father did, and that was uh, to have me as his avenuensis while he was hearing cases. And uh, that was very interesting indeed. So I used to sit on the bench beside him and at his dictation record the evidence. You would record the evidence. Mm. Fascinating. So at what, what age were you? Oh, teens. Oh, that must have been wonderful. That was great, yes. Yes. It was very interesting to uh, here, the case being thrashed out in court uh, between counsel and all the rest of it. Absolutely. Mm. So I did you get a scholarship to come to Cambridge? No, but I believe that when I was born, uh, the first thing my father did was to enter my name in, uh, in Trinity Hall, the college. Uh, it was, and as a second thought, he inquired after the after his wife and baby. <laughs> he was devoted to the hall. Had, so, were you the first family member to go to Trinity Hall? Oh no, no! My grandfather was at Trinity Hall, and my father was there. Fascinating. And my daughter uh, has been there. So. So it's a long tradition. Oh, very long tradition. So when you came across, you came on your own? Uh, well, I came with my father. With your father, initially? Yes. That's did in 1939. Did he go back after that? Uh, yes, he went back. He just came and brought you? That's right. Yes. By ship? Uh, in those days, yes, yes, by ship. And partly overland. By ship to Marseille and then over, over France uh, to England. So uh, when you came, the sort of war clouds were gathering. Very much so, yes. So I think it was inevitable then. Was there an ominous sense as you made the journey that maybe, you know, your boat might be attacked or it was perhaps too early at that point? Uh, no, it was too early at that date. But uh, we knew that war was coming, yes. but quite when it would come. We just didn't know. No. So, um, you you obviously, I mean, you, you had a very happy childhood in Ceylon. Do you have any, before we move to the time when you arrived in Cambridge, do you have any specific recollections of your childhood? No. It, as, as you say, a very happy childhood. And uh, for a long time I was the only child. Uh, you see, my mother died when I was 17 days old, but I had, I think, 
the world's most marvellous stepmother. She really was absolutely super. Uh, no, I can't remember anything outstanding or special about the childhood, except that it was a very happy childhood. And when you arrived in Cambridge yes. as a young, impressionable man at the age of 18... That's right. Did you find that it was a big change from living in from life in Ceylon? No, because I think uh, the life in Ceylon was more or less uh, modelled on the English style, so it was it was no change, great change, as far as I was concerned. Uh, so um, it, it, you basically must have come to Southampton first, or to Liverpool. No, no. Uh, we came to Marseille in the south of France and then travelled overland France uh, and crossed the, the, the channel. Gosh, it sounds so exciting. Well, well, it's all very new. Yes. And uh, I was thrilled to come. I was looking, I'd been looking forward to it for years. Still, there you are. That was plan for you right from the beginning as, That's right. as, a, as a young boy That's right. you knew this would be your future mm. so when you arrived in Cambridge the war had not yet war had not yet been declared is not that right? yet declared no. No. We, well, we landed in England I think in, in the August and of course war was declared in about a month's time after that about a month mm. do you remember how it felt when that happened when the declaration was made? Well, I can tell you almost exactly. I remember vividly. Uh, uh, we heard the news while we, uh, my father and I were still in, in the street. I don't know what we were doing there, but perhaps we were there. And then we heard that uh, we were at war because we knew from the previous evening's news that... Uh, an ultimatum had been given to Germany and that this would now expire the morning, the following morning, which it did. Uh, and your father was still with you? He well, you, gone yes, back indeed, yes, yes, he was. So you were in the streets of Cambridge? That, uh, not in Cambridge, but in London. In London? Yes. So yes. it must have been a, quite a sombre moment. Very sombre moment. Yes. We're not quite sure what to expect. No. And he still had to go back. He, he had, had to, to go back. back. That's right. Uh, he travelled back, I think, sometime October or November. Uh, and you would only have known that he was he had arrived by letter, really, when when he wrote to you. Or cable. Or cable. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. So life for you as a young student began at Downing College. Not Downing. At at, at Trinity, Trinity Hall. Hall. Yes. And do you have any recollections of Trinity Hall in those early days? Uh, only that it still seemed to me to be a, a, a carryover from the peacetime. Cambridge. Uh, rationing hadn't really begun to bite and all the rest of it. So the first year was really a sort of continuation of the old peacetime Cambridge and Trinity Hall. Much the same. Much the same, yes. So in the second year, did the student numbers drop? They did, yes. Uh, <coughs> I think the reason is that Practically every Cambridge college, in fact, not practically, every Cambridge college uh, had given over half its buildings to the Royal Air Force. Hmm. So uh, we had the RAF quartered in Trinity Hall as in other colleges. So did you eat with them in the college? Uh, no. No. no, 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 no. They had their uh, own time for meals and we had our own times. And uh, although I think as far as the undergraduates were concerned, we were all very willing and anxious uh, to make friends with the uh, servicemen, but I think it was the service 
uh, that said no. This, uh, this is service life for them. We don't want too much fraternizing. We did fraternize on the sports field, playing rugby occasionally and soccer. Mm. But apart from that, there was very little contact. Quite formal. Very formal. So, did you notice in the second year that um, there were changes in the rationing set in, um, changes in the college to the way? Was there a difference? as the war progressed? Well, yes, the rationing, of course, got tighter and tighter. But apart from that, one adapted to the uh, slowly changing lifestyle. And you just did the best you could? Indeed, yes. Yes, yes. But there were fewer students and fewer lecturers That is true. Quite a number of the lecturers had been called up or went into the services. Uh, fewer students, of course. So yeah. do you recall roughly how many students there were in your class? Mm. I can't recall that offhand. But since all the colleges... Uh, attended lectures together and so on and so forth. It seemed quite a full house. But yes, mm. yes. But certainly nothing like the numbers that you have today, where you have about 250 in the first year. No, 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 not, 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 no. nothing like that, no. Did, so did your lectures take place in quite, a, with quite a formal atmosphere? Did you wear gowns? Oh, yes, always. And we had to wear gowns after dark in the streets. Uh, so was there much, after obviously you had your lectures, you had to do your studying, was there much socialising? I find that very difficult to answer because uh, I have no experience of what it was like before the war. But... Such as there was, I should have thought, uh, there was a good deal of socialising between the colleges and in the college itself, yes. What form did that take? Uh, chiefly, I think, over tea, tea time. Um, because with the rationing, it was very difficult to organise dinner parties and things like that. Yes. But, uh, and of course one did meet members of other colleges in lectures and after lectures and of course in the sports field. So that was quite an important form of uh, social recreation. Oh indeed, yes. So we come now to some of your lecturers in this period, 1939 to 42, when you did your law degree. And I wonder if we can look or talk about some of the professors. Professor Buckland is the first one that springs to mind. Was he one of your lecturers? Very much so. Uh, in fact, in my uh, final year, I took a, a very special subject, which nobody had taken for years, and uh, I used to go to Professor Buckland uh, every week to his house and uh, receive instruction from him first hand at his house. How oh, delightful. Yes. Was this in Cranmer Road? Uh, was it Cranmer Road, Professor Buckland? May have been, I've forgotten yes. now. Uh, and what subject was this? Uh, well, Roman law. Which was his speciality. Which was he? He was, the, uh, he was the world authority in the subject. Had you any experience of Roman law before you came to Cambridge? No. No. Because you'd been a schoolboy. That's right, he, yes. yes. Mm. And um, was he a, a, a nice man, Professor Buckland? He was, of course, very highly regarded. Was he 
Oh, heavens, he was tremendously regarded. But he was also a very peppery uh, and, I suppose, rather a frightening figure. <laughs> he was a tiny little man. But, uh, and, uh... Very forthright. Very forthright, yes. But one had the greatest admiration for him. It must have been quite an experience to be the sole student. I mean, you had to be well prepared. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, he was a person who didn't suffer fools gladly, <laughs> and uh, one had to yeah. be very careful to come thoroughly prepared and so on and so forth. But underneath all that, he was very kind and very helpful. And dedicated. Oh, very much, yes. Someone else who taught you was Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht. Yes. Any recollections of him? Yes, he was a, a remarkable lecturer. I've never seen him with any notes in his hand. God. He used to lecture, as it were, uh, out of his head and uh, never at a loss for a word or phrase and his lectures were remarkably good. Wonderful. Fascinating. Yes, that was great. So you, you really felt you learned something? Oh, very much so. Did, did you have supervisions with him as well? Or oh, no, no, no. He was a professor, and professors didn't supervise, didn't. No, no. no. Did you ever have occasion to meet his son? Ellie. Ellie Lauterbach. Oh, yes, very much. Ellie was... Uh, he was a junior to me as an undergraduate, and he went to Trinity. Yes, I had quite a few, quite a few. dealings with Ellie, yes. So... I'll ask you more about him when we come to your colleagues at Cambridge, oh. when you became a, a lecturer. I see, all right. Professor Winfield? Yes, yes. I'm very, very fond of Winfield. Uh, and, um, of course, he was at John's. I didn't sort of socialise, if I may use that word, with him very much. But nevertheless... Uh, we used to enjoy his lectures very much indeed. Were those lectures on taught? Taught, yes. And of course you later edited the the work, the oh, yes, work yes. on taught, mm. which I will return to when we talk about your work. So you must have at an early stage been inspired by him because you later excelled in the law of taught. Oh, yes. Yes. Percy Winfield was, uh, I think, a very uh, prominent figure in my sort of life, and uh, and also uh, he had a very dry sense of humour, which <laughs> it was very pleasing, I <laughs> must say. The Yule Professor McNair must have given you lectures in international law, perhaps? Uh, no, it was Professor Lauterpacht who did the lecturing oh. in international law. I was never lectured to by McNair, oh. but I did get to know him. So that what? stage he wasn't, perhaps, uh, doing international law? No, I don't think, no, he was not lecturing then. So d do you have any recollections of him? Of McNair? Yes. Uh, not uh, uh, as vivid as I have of the people who actually did lecture and who I came into contact with. Professor Hazeltine, perhaps? No, Hazeltine, no. Do you know, the only recollection I have of Hazeltine was that when the outbreak, when war broke out, Hazeltine went round shaking people by the hand and said, we'll see this through together, old boy. <laughs> and as soon as France collapsed, he was sold off to America. Never saw him again. <laughs> it's wonderful. Oh, <laughs> 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 And Professor Cuttridge? Oh, yes. He was, yes, marvellous. And he was a wonderful cook. Was he? Oh, yes, rather. 
Uh, did he invite you for meals? Or uh, no, you? again, you yeah. see, rationing uh, oh. constrained us all. Yes. No, I haven't actually uh, been entertained by him in that way. But that was something he liked to do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was a wonderful man, a cook. He was a great friend of uh, Professor Lipstein. Yes. He paid him from his own pocket That's when he didn't get his lectureship at Trinity. Professor Lipstein was um, in an awkward situation. And well, I know he was at Trinity first. Yes. And um, mm. Professor Guttridge came to his aid. Well, I'm not a bit surprised. He, he was like that. A very good person. Oh, yes. Did he lecture you? Guttridge? Uh, yes, not a very extensively, but I did attend some courses of his lectures. Was that comparative law? Uh, mm, yes, I suppose, in a way, yes. And then uh, Harry Holland at that stage was a reader and perhaps you were taught by him? Lectured to by him, yes. A very formidable and very frightening figure, but again, very kind underneath all that. Yes. He lived, his wife lived in a separate house, as I understand. Uh, that's right, I think, it, uh, immediately after they got married. The rumour was that uh, they then went to their um, respective establishments and stayed there for the rest of their <laughs> lives. <laughs> well, Professor Lipstein describes him as a typical Yorkshireman. Oh, I wouldn't uh, like to comment on that. I wouldn't yeah. know what a typical Yorkshireman is. <laughs> <laughs> uh. well, some of the lecturers that lectured you include Wade, Sir, Sir Emlyn Wade. Well, he was a professor, yes. Uh, now, Emlyn Wade, uh, he knew my father very well Ooh. when my father was up here. And, uh, and he, too, was an extremely kind man. And, uh, formidable in a way, but nevertheless kind. And the Regis Professor of Civil Law was... Buckland. Uh, at, well, who, who succeeded him later. Well, at the time I'm talking, you're right, it was Buckland then. But the lecturer, Duff. Yes, Patrick Duff, yes. Later became the Professor That's of Civil right. Law. That's right, yes. Did he teach you Roman Law? Yes, he did. He did lecture. <coughs> Do you have any recollections of him? Not very many, because I didn't come across him all that much. But uh, He wasn't quite as eminent as Buckland. No, not as eminent. Uh, and uh, he didn't do very much. He didn't mm, write an awful lot. He wrote... Uh, one textbook, but that's about all. And he didn't write any articles either, so he didn't really contribute an awful lot. That wasn't that prolific? No. No. Somebody called Mr. Barnes, do you remember oh, him? Oh, Henry Barnes, yes. He was at Jesus. He was a lecturer in criminal law. <coughs> Our own supervisor, <coughs> excuse me, in Trinity Hall, warned us against going to uh, uh, to Mr. Barnes. Uh, and uh, after a couple of lectures from Mr. Barnes, I gave up. Uh, the point was that uh, the Law Department of London University was had been evacuated to Cambridge, and Mr. Seaborn Davis was the lecturer in criminal law to London University. So all the people of my college attended uh, Seaborn Davis's lectures and not Henry Barnes's lectures. Interesting. No other recollections of him? 
Well, it certainly was. Yes. Uh, uh, he was very fond of the motto, I must say. Uh, but no, it didn't come to us no. very much. Dr. Ellis Lewis. Ah, yes. He was a fellow of my college, Trinity Hall, oh. and he was uh, my supervisor in my second and third years. Oh, yes, I remember Ellis Lewis very well indeed. A very nice man. Hmm? He was a very nice man. Very nice man. He was also the librarian for a number of years of the Squire, Squire, Library. Squire Law Library. Yes. That's right, yes. yes. And Bailey? Uh, uh, yes. He was at St. John's. Uh, again, I was not actually supervised by him, but I was lectured to him, uh, lectured to by him. And uh, uh, his wife was an international lawn tennis player. Oh. So I used to have uh, tennis games with her quite a lot. Yes. Sounds very nice. Oh, yes, yes. Late, he later became a professor, Mr. Hampson. Do you remember him? Do you Very well, indeed, when you were a yes. Student? Well, of course, uh, Hampson was taken prisoner of war, uh, and uh, he only came back to Cambridge after the uh, war was over. And uh, again, I got to know Hampson very well, indeed. So, when we come to your time as a lecturer at Cambridge, perhaps we can. Hear more about your recollections of of Jack Hampson. Of Hampson. Yes, mm. lovely. Mr. Jackson, any recollection of him? Oh yes. Uh, well, he was uh, my supervisor during my first year. He was at St. John's. Um, um, a very good lecturer, but apart from that. I don't know that I had very much to do with him. Someone else that was around when you were a student was Mr. Wally Tooker. Oh, Wally Tooker of Downing. Yes, yes he, he supervised me during my first year. Uh, no, I haven't got any outstanding recollections of him, except that he was quite a character in his quiet way. <laughs> So, your fellow students at that stage would have been perhaps René David, or would he have been a bit older than you? Oh, older. older. I never, I don't think I ever met him. Ah. So and know. David Daub? Oh, David Dauber. Oh, yes. Yes, he uh, uh, lectured to me quite a bit, and uh, in my final year, I used to go to him, uh, to his house, uh, for instructions. He didn't lecture in the uh, law school, but since I was the only student doing that particular subject, I used to go and uh, take instruction from him at his home. Very interesting. And what subject was that? Roman law. Roman law. Mm. I've read that he was he had quite a sense of humour. David Dover? Yes. Mm, yes, I wouldn't say outstanding, you know, but a no. uh, very gentle man, yes. He went across and had a good career in America. Mm. And um, he, in fact, lived to quite, quite a ripe old age. Well, I believe he did, yes. yes. So, do you remember at that stage Professor Lipstein, when you were a student, he would have been doing his, uh, he would have finished his PhD. Oh, he'd finished his PhD, but then he was interned for the first part of the war, and I got to know Lipstein uh, in the middle of the war when uh, he was released from his internment and uh, 
and I got to know him better and better as years went by. Yes. Very fond of Felix Stein. Yes. He died a very short while ago. It was seemed to us all very sudden, even though he was 97. I know. We we still were, were didn't expect him to die somehow. So <laughs> we were. Well, this takes us up to the war. You joined up in 1942, and until 1946, you served as a rear gunner. Yes. Why in the Coastal Command? How did that come about? Uh, well, I don't think the choice lay with, with, with me or any individual uh, when I joined the RAF. Uh, we were drafted into Coastal Command. I see. And wh wh where did you fly? F from where? Y well, it was the very northeast of Scotland. Uh, Kinloss, Dalcross, Lossiemouth and Wick on the northern arm of the Mare Firth. Uh, we were covering the North Sea submarines and coastal reconnaissance down the Scandinavian coast, Dutch and Belgian coasts. Fascinating. For three years you mm. were... Yes. Yes. So you must have sometimes been quite uncomfortable. I you don't recollect being uncomfortable. No. Yeah. You, you were sort of not... Um, I mean, you were in, in a plane, basically, for most of the time, your yes. active service. Yes, yes, indeed. But uh, what, do you remember the conditions? How many of, the, of you were there in the plane? Oh, I know. Well, we were um, what we call a Leelite squadron. Uh, the Leelite was a, a half million candle power searchlight fixed to the underside of the plane and uh, we had to home onto the submarine by radar and in the last mile or so switch on the lee light and if we'd done our drill properly the submarine would then be in the centre of the beam and then we dropped our depth charges visually so uh, gosh so it, it does sound to me like um, quite an experience, a, a, you know, quite a change from your life at Cambridge. Oh, very much so, yes. But you seem to have taken it all in your stride. Oh, I, I confess I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, it's not a very nice thing to say, perhaps, of wartime activities, but still they are. It... it the contrast between writing your jurisprudence book, your t jurisprudence textbook, to being um, a rear gunner is, to me, quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whether you were thinking jurisprudence, jurisprudential thoughts as you were flying. I don't recollect <laughs> any. <laughs> Just as well, perhaps. <laughs> so... You returned after the war to, you went to London, you became a barrister. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I took my bar exams while I was still in the services. Uh, but after I was demobilised, I came back to Trinity Hall. I didn't go to London. Immediately. Did you go to London when you became a barrister? No, no. not really, no. So you were never actually, you didn't actually spend time in London in the aftermath of the war? No. Did you practice? No. Did you practice as a barrister? No. No. You were appointed then to a position at Aberystwyth in yes. 1941. Uh, 41, was it? Let me see. No. 1949. 49, 1949. Yes. You were there until 1951. Mm-hmm. Yes. What, what made you go to Aberystwyth? Well, there was at that time no opening in Cambridge and um, I don't know who it was. I think it was perhaps Harry Holland or 
Det Lis Lewis or someone uh, who got in touch with the professor at Aberystwyth, Professor Louis Fred Davis, who uh, had a vacancy on his staff. And uh, he offered me a, a lectureship through, through the U University at Aberystwyth. And I went there. Did you enjoy your time there? Enormously. Must have been quite a different sort of place to Cambridge. Oh, very different. I don't know what it's like now. I haven't been back to Aberystwyth for years and years. But it really was a very enjoyable place. Um, Out of the way. <laughs> yes, very but, uh, remote. Oh, very, very. Yes. Uh, that made it all the, uh, all the friendlier. Yeah, you know, in there. I can imagine. Mm. So, who were the most influential people on in your on you during that time? Well, the influential characters that you met when you were at Aberystwyth. Oh well, the professor, Professor Lewis Davies. In fact, it was a small law department, and um, we all uh, worked together. Well, we've covered the period from your early life in Ceylon up to and including your time at Aberystwyth. Next time, perhaps we can cover your time at Cambridge University and your work. Uh, you went as a student at the university? Or? As a lecturer. Oh, as a lecturer, as a right, lecturer. yes. That would be um, huh. from about 1951 to 1985. I see, yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Dyer. Not at all. It's <laughs> interesting. Thank you. Nothing spectacular. Um, all very interesting. <laughs>